I started a message on the 18th of um, December called, Who is Jesus? And uh, it had five points. I've asked the Lord to forgive me for that. But it had five points, and it was an acrostic, an acrostic, which means I was going to link up uh, to help me, to help others remember who Jesus is by attaching a word that describes him to the J and the E and the S and the U and the S. And uh, so we started out uh, with that. And uh, I, I think it's interesting that the, change, the thing that will change our lives is not only getting saved, and, that, and that's the highlight of anybody's life, trusting Christ and getting saved. But the bottom line is salvation is so much more than that moment. I mean, we rejoice when a baby is born. I mean, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. But Jesus' life was so much more than just his birth. And so uh, when a baby's born, I mean, that's not the end. That's the beginning. And uh, I found that with our two children, uh, that Tammy just uh, turned uh, 54 on uh, on, on Friday, and uh, man, I didn't think I was 54, <laughs> let alone having a daughter that's 54. And uh, so it, it is really literally an amazing thing to know that she is my, still my little girl. And my son is still my son that I'm so very proud of. And because they'll be my children forever. And so it is with Jesus. The important thing is not to just have a child, but to have a relationship with that child. Not only to get saved, but have a relationship with Christ. And uh, there's not one part that's more important than the other part. Not one. I mean, my relationship, I feel like is as close as it's ever been with the Lord. And so I can't say that this is a better time than, than before when I got saved or any other time, but it's wrapped up in that relationship. Now, there was a story that I heard this week, and, and it was a lady was uh, dealing with trouble, a little bit of uh, depression. <laughs> And she was really down. She, she was not doing well. In fact, she was dealing with major depression. And so she decided, which was a good thing, to pick up the Bible and start reading. Now, where she ended up was probably what she did was just open the Bible somewhere and see what was there. And... Um, you know, that can be dangerous. Uh, one fellow opened the Bible and, and, it's, and it said, uh, and Judas went and hanged himself. Then he said, well, that's not good. I'm going to go over here. And it says, uh, it says now, uh, yeah, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> and uh, whatever you do, do it with all speed. Uh, so anyway, but, um, but she, wrote, she opened the Bible to Psalm 96, and she found a, in that scripture, she found, and I'm sure many of us are acquainted with the song, Shout to the Lord. What a great song. And she went to the piano and began to play that song and to write the words to that song. And not only that, it, the Bible says that all the earth let him sing power and majesty, praise to the king. When the enemy gets you down, a lot of times we can just go to the word of God and she went to Psalm 96 and it changed her life. There is power in the word of God. Now in our 
in our acrostic about Jesus, we started out, and I'm not going to I'm not going to really spend much time on the first two parts or the first three parts we did. But we started out by Matthew chapter 13 and verses 55 and to 75 to, to 57. I'm sorry. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers or brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? When then has this man all these things, and they were offended by him? The only way that someone will not be offended by Jesus is to understand who Jesus really is. The world hates Christ because they do not understand nor do they believe who Christ is. Well, then who is he? Well, number one, the J stands for Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah God. And we went through the scriptures that really illustrate the fact that Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus and the Father are one, along with the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We call it the Trinity, but it's a little hard to understand, other than I believe that we understand that by understanding that I am a Trinity. I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit now that's alive. So I am three in one. And, that's, that's, uh, and by the way, that's what God meant by what he said, let us make man in our own image. So Jesus is Jehovah. Is Jehovah. The second, the E stands for eternal. Jesus didn't just live 33 years on the face of the earth. He lives everlastingly. He was before time began in eternity past. He's lived through this period of time when we've been on the face of the earth as human beings. And he will live for eternally as Jesus is eternal. He's not only Jehovah, but he is eternal. He, therefore, can give us eternal life as he died for us on the cross. Then the next S stands for substitute. Jesus is our substitute. More personally, he's my substitute. And he's your substitute. He went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. He bore my sin on the cross. In all reality, I wouldn't want to have to bear my sin. Now the fact is, those that reject Christ will bear their own sin for eternity in the place called hell. But Jesus suffered what I would suffer if I had to go to the cross. He suffered physically. He suffered in his soul, but he also suffered in his spirit because he died, suffered and died for every man, woman, child that has ever been born throughout the 6,000 six years of history. Now today, I want to go to the U. And I like these last two points because of the fact of what they stand for. Number four, Jesus is universal. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? In other words, Jesus 
is for everyone. You know, sometimes in America we feel like we're a little bit better than the rest of the world. That we, we have attained certain things and certain qualities that's in the world that makes us better. We have more. Many times we enjoy more. We have more freedom. We have a lot of things. But the bottom line is Jesus died for the little tribe that's somewhere out there that nobody's even found yet. Jesus died for every person in Africa. Jesus died for everybody in the Far East. Jesus died for everyone in Europe. Jesus died for everyone in North America. Jesus died for everyone in Canada. Jesus died for everyone on the islands. Jesus died for everybody in South America. Jesus died for everyone. And everyone or anyone can have Jesus. You know, one of these days, one of these days, we're going to get our minds and our hearts all fixed. Because when we get to, get to heaven, we're going to see all kinds of folks. It's going to be a wonderful time when we get to heaven because there's going to be every nationality, every group of people, every, every tongue, every tribe, because Jesus is international. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the scripture. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, it says, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the people in America. No. <laughs> Jesus taketh away the sin of the world. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, who's lost? We're all lost. Even as little babies, even though we're innocent to the time of, of recognition when we sin, but we all are lost. We're all lost. And Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus came for everyone. He is universal. In John chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light hath, is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You see, if Jesus would have never come, everybody that ever lived would have to spend eternity in hell. Jesus did not need to come to, to, the, uh, to uh, condemn us because we're already condemned. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to redeem us. Jesus came to buy us back. And whosoever, whosoever. You know, when I, when I was uh, being taught how to um, win people to Jesus, I was taught when I got to this next uh, series of verses to do something. In John chapter, or Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13, says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart thou, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is, is uh, over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I was taught when I was talking to people about the Lord, uh, about, uh, about salvation, that I would come to the place and come to that, ver that verse, verse 13, and, and I would say, well, let's put your name in there. And, um, and I would say, for John, shall, if John shall call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. And the Lord convicted me of that. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is God didn't come just for John. He came for whosoever. He came for whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. That's the difference. And so I stopped using that and said, yeah, you can put your name in there, but I want you to understand that God came for every person that's ever been born in this world that he might save them if they would call upon his name. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 21 it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts chapter 16 verses 30 and 31 says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I mean, what a better verse in the Bible to say, How do we get saved? I mean, here's Philip, he's there, and Philip said, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And it's not Philip, that's uh, the, the um, uh, yes, the jailer, uh, that where he was in prison. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now see, I believe that. I believe if dad will get saved, most likely the rest of the house is going to get saved. That's why, that's why Satan has aimed his attack at the fathers of America and the families of America. But whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ and shall, shall be saved and his, in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. House. First Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First John chapter 5 verses 13 to, or 10 to 13 says, And he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now how hard is that to understand? If I have the Son of God, if I've asked Jesus to forgive my sins, to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, and to become my Savior, and I have Jesus Christ living in me, guess what? I have Jesus, and if I have Jesus, I have eternal life. Boy, what a promise. But it's not just to me. It's to every person that's ever been born, every person that hears the message of the gospel which simply means good news, good news, Jesus died for you and you can be saved and have eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. One of the key things is we need to know that we're saved. We don't have to worry about it, wonder about it, hope for it or whatever. But we need to know that we have, the etern have eternal life. Well, how do we know? If we have Jesus, we have eternal life. That's how you know. It's eternal. Jesus is not only eternal, but it, he's universal. Lastly, 
Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let them that are, that, let him that is a, 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 a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The call goes out to anybody and everyone to come. And Jesus said, whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. The last S, the last S stands for sustainer. And I'm, I'm glad that Jesus is Jehovah. I don't understand all of that. I mean, I understand that he's Jehovah. I don't understand eternity because it's beyond my mind. But Jesus is eternal. He's my substitute. I understand that, but my, how overwhelming is that, that Jesus died for me on the cross. And Jesus is universal. That Jesus wants every man, every woman, no matter how wicked, to be saved. But lastly, he's my sustainer. If you want to follow along in the Word of God, it's, I'm going to go to a very familiar passage because I'm going to go to Psalm chapter 23. And I'm going to give you seven things. I asked the Lord to forgive me, and he said, okay, I'll let you do it in the last part here. But seven things in the Psalm where Jesus is my, our sustainer. Number one, Jesus is our shepherd. The Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I don't, I don't know how much that means to you or if we just have memorized that along the way and, and we just sort of put it in there. But the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, do you understand what that means? It means Jesus Christ. He called himself the good shepherd. That means he is my shepherd. The Bible describes us and, and describes everybody on earth as nothing more than sheep. Sheep. Now, they say that sheep, now even though they're very cute, and lambs are just adorable. But the fact is, sheep are kind of dumb. They get lost. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. But the fact is, we are either, we either have a shepherd or we are on our own. Do you understand that? I mean, the Bible makes it clear in truth that either we have someone that is in charge of us and guiding us and helping us, or we're on our own. And I, I'll be, I mean, you know, I'm a 77-year-old man, and I'm going to tell you something. It is not good to be on your own. Somewhere along the line in my, in my ministry, I, I adopted the little saying that sin makes you stupid. You find anybody that messes up, they're pretty stupid. Downright stupid. A little lamb that goes off all by itself and gets lost, that lamb is stupid. But either we have a shepherd that guides us and takes care of us, or we're on our own. Who is our shepherd? Jesus is our shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. And then again, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, and he says, and when the, 
he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were uh, scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. We either have the good shepherd watching over us or we have no shepherd whatsoever. That's what's wrong with the world right now. We're living in a world that is, is doing what they feel is right in their own hearts, in their own minds. They have no shepherd. But I'm glad I have a shepherd. The second thing we find in verse 2, it says, Jesus is our satisfaction. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Like the little boy who was trying to learn that says, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. Why? Because when you have the Lord, you have everything. Little lady came to me one time and she was real distraught. And she said, preacher, my husband has passed away and I'm having a difficult time and, and, and I've got trouble in the, in the, in the family and just, it's just horrible right now. In fact, you know, all I have is the Lord. And I said, well, you know, that's kind of like saying all I have is a million dollars in the bank. All I have is, is a Chateaubriand steak to eat. All I have is a mansion to live in. When we have the Lord and he is our shepherd, you know what? He wants our best and that's my satisfaction. Do you know, maybe the older you get, you get this way and I, and I had a lot of drive when I was a kid and so forth, but you know, I've come to realize that God is going to give me Everything I need and not give me things necessarily that I want. Because the Lord's my shepherd. I think one of the hardest things as a teenager is who am I going to marry? Man, that's tough. Who am I going to marry? And I, I went to a big church. There were a lot of kids in my youth group and we, we, uh, we sort of dated, uh, uh, the guys dated the gals and for a little while and or did things with them and, and so forth. And, uh, and I thought, man, it's, it's, uh, who, who's going to come into my life? And all of a sudden, a young lady who had never been to our church before <coughs> came in the back door and I looked and my eyeballs popped out about this far. And I said, holy moly, who is that? And I, I, in the end of the service, I was sitting up front. She was sitting in the back with her girlfriend. And I, and I came along and, and I said, man, I, I'm going to see her at the end of the service. I don't know where, if she lives here, lives somewhere else, I don't know. But I'm going to try to meet her. She's the prettiest girl I think I've ever seen in my life. And all of a sudden, I looked at the back of the church, and there was nobody there. I said, holy moly, man, we got we to gotta do something about this. So I, I sort of scooted out the church, and I looked, and there were two girls walking down to the parking lot. They were probably about a half a block away. And I ran, and I caught up with them, and I asked Ruthie to go with me to McDonald's. I was a big spender in those days. But she did. Where did she come from? How would I know that one day when I have been ill, that she gets up at 3 o'clock every morning to tend to my physical needs and then tries to go back to sleep? How would I know that she would care about me. I didn't know that. I didn't know if I'd ever meet her. But you know who did know? God knew. When I was, when I was in school about to graduate, and I was wondering, I mean, will I ever get to go to a church and be a pastor? 
And I went, and my pastor helped me get a job at a church in Dallas. Never been to Dallas before, never been to Texas before, but I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> but I was there, and, and, and I was in this, this, I was an assistant pastor, youth director, which was fine, but that's not what I wanted. And I said, Lord, how in the world, what, I mean, do you, do you really understand my heart? Do you understand that what I want? Do you understand that I have this longing that you put in my heart to be a pastor? And the Lord said, hey, I got it. In one Sunday, now th this is how God works. The pastor was out of town, so he asked me to preach. Galilean Baptist Church, downtown, downtown Dallas, on the other side of the river, in Oak Cliff. And a couple people came from Longview, Texas. They'd never been there before and sat down and afterwards said, young man, we just lost our pastor. Would you consider coming to our church? I said, hallelujah, yes. I would love to come and, and uh, uh, preach for you. And I got the flu, and it was terrible, but they called me anyway. They would, the vote was 25 to 2. I stayed 10 years looking for those two people. <laughs> Jesus is my satisfaction. Do you understand that? That he makes our life a reality of blessing. Then the third thing is Jesus is our provider. It says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures and leadeth me beside the still waters. I'm not going to say much about this, but you know, Back, back in the early part of this century, or, or the, 19, the 20th century, which is the 1900s, you know, they had range wars in the, in the West because some farmers had cows and some farmers had sheep. And the, then the ranchers with cows hated the herders with sheep. You know Why? Because when, cow, when cows eat and horses eat, they, they simply eat the top of the, of the grass. But when sheep eat, they go down and pull up the roots so there's, when they leave, there's no more grass there. And the farmers hated it. And people were killed over it. Now, very important is this. When you are a shepherd of the sheep, you got to keep the sheep moving. Because if you leave them in the same spot, there's no, no grass to eat. So they, gotta, they have to what? They have to go to the green pastures, you see, where there's still grass. And he leadeth me beside the still water. You know, if sheep get in the water, guess what happens to them? They go floating away. So God watches over us. Jesus watches over us. So we always have something to eat. David said it. I've been young and now I'm old. I have not seen God's people starving to death. Then Jesus is our encourager. In verse 3 it says, And he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You want your soul Renewed, restored, uplifted, do continuously what's right. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. If we can get set in our life, and I, I guarantee those of us that are older can look back in our lives and when we made bad decisions, you know what? We regret it. It haunts us. It, we wish we could go back and change it. 
And young people, you have the opportunity to do what's right continually over and over and over again. And he will restore you, restore your soul for his name's sake. Why? Because he's responsible for us. And then Jesus is our strength over fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. There will be times in our life when we walk through the shadow of death. Either for others that we love dearly or for ourselves. But God will walk with us through it. And his rod and his staff, they'll comfort me. Number six, Jesus is our peace in time of trouble. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because I haven't experienced it here at this church. But it's an awful thing for a pastor. An awful thing for a pastor. Who looks out into the congregation and there are people that make faces at him. But they're not good faces. They're people that have a, a book and they raise the book up and, and say, I'm reading this book while you're preaching. People who are planning your demise. And sometimes we are faced with those who just don't like the fact that we preach the Word of God. It's a horrible experience. But you know what? The Bible says He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. The oil of the Holy Spirit, the oil of renewal. And he says, my cup runneth over. And then lastly, Jesus is our hope for the future. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, it didn't say that we caught up with, with uh, goodness and mercy. It says, when we let the shepherd lead us, goodness and mercy shall what? Follow us. Shall follow us. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus, Jesus, is Jehovah. He is eternal. He is my substitute and your substitute. He is the one who is universal. He'll not only save me, he'll save anyone. And number five, he's my sustainer in life. Jesus. If you can remember those five little things, you'll not have any problem. Remember who, who he, Jesus is. Let him be your good shepherd. Let him lead you. So thankful that he came as a little child. But there's so much more than him being a little child. <coughs> Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we thank you today. We thank you today for your goodness to us. 
We thank you for Jesus. There is, there's just no way that we can thank you enough for sending Jesus, for Jesus being willingness to come. and to die for us on the cross, to be our Savior. Help us. Help us to know that we belong to Him And if we'll follow him, we can have the life that you desire for us to have. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.